What's up everyone? Welcome back to another Tidal Gardens Coral Spotlight. This video is all about Acropora. Acropora are what many consider to be the king of SPS corals. They are some of the most challenging stony corals to keep. However, there is good news for hobbyists looking to try Acropora for the first time. There's more information and technology available today than ever before, some of which we will cover right now. All right, let's dive in. Acropora are a genus of small polyp stony corals found in reefs throughout the world. They grow branching colonies that take on a variety of forms ranging from staghorns, elk horns, or even flat tables. Acropora are one of the primary reef building corals and are responsible for a large percentage of a reef's calcium carbonate structure. As far as the hobby is concerned, there is little doubt that Acropora are the crown jewel of the SPS world. No other genus captivates the imagination of hobbyists quite like these fuzzy sticks. People dedicate entire aquarium builds just to grow this coral, as the quote-unquote Acropora-dominated SPS tank has become an aspirational goal for many aquarists. No other genus has the sheer number of documented species as Acropora, and when reef aquarists talk about the requirements to keep an SPS system generally, they're really only talking about the care requirements specific to Acropora. If you don't believe me, there are plenty of SPS that are not that much more difficult to keep than any other stony coral, such as Seriatopora, Posilopora, Stylophora, Pavona, even Montipora. But difficulty associated with keeping SPS is largely descriptive of the care requirements for Acropora and that gets projected onto all the other SPS corals. That illustrates the gravity that this particular genus of coral has. You would never hear anyone look at the care requirements for, say, Pavona, and blanket the rest of the SPS world with it, but that's exactly what happens with Acropora. So let's take a look at what makes Acropora more difficult to care for. To put it simply, they are highly sensitive to changes in water chemistry and are demanding in terms of flow and light. Unlike more forgiving corals, Acropora demonstrate their displeasure in one of two ways. They either change color to something unappealing in the mild cases, or they outright die right before your eyes in the severe cases. Many experienced hobbyists have struggled keeping Acropora long term, but that ironically is part of the attraction to this coral. Now taking on new challenges and improving one's husbandry is a good thing in this hobby, and successfully keeping Acropora serves as a nice high bar of success. What is it about Acropora that captivates hobbyists? For many reef aquarists, an SPS-dominated tank full of Acropora is love at first sight. Although the SPS tank often lacks the mesmerizing movement of other types of reefs filled with euphilia or anemones, they are beautiful in their own right. The Acropora dominated tank is a bright explosion of color where each nook and cranny is its own fireworks show. Acropora come in every color imaginable and their color palette is highly variable. A colony grown in one system can change color dramatically when moved to another system. I occasionally visit friends that had purchased an Acropora from me, and I'm amazed at how much it's changed in their aquariums. It's completely unrecognizable from its time in my possession. This is especially true if they're doing something completely different in their system, such as running an ultra-low nutrient methodology, for example. The color variability of Acropora also feeds that desire for a challenge. With these corals, it's not good enough to just have them survive and grow, but also to express the most aesthetically pleasing colors. The lengths that experienced SPS keepers will go to to have ultimate coloration is staggering. 
Although they don't look it, Acropora are an aggressive coral. They don't have stinging sweeper tentacles or engage in chemical warfare, but they pack a powerful sting, especially to nearby SPS. When two Acropora touch, winners and losers are determined really quickly. One of the most frustrating things to have happen in an SPS-dominated tank is to have one colony to get dislodged and fall into another colony below. Even if you catch it quickly, there can be insane amounts of damage in just that short interaction. If the fall wasn't caught until the next day, it's possible that both colonies could die. Sometimes, it doesn't even require one coral falling into another. Acropora grow quickly, and two colonies can grow in close proximity to one another. I personally have been lulled into this false sense of security until one day, the two colonies get a tiny bit too close to one another, and I wake up to two colonies that are half-exposed skeleton. When thinking of placement, think ahead and give them plenty of room to grow. Now that we've covered some background information on Acropora, let's talk about their care requirements. The challenge of keeping Acropora is tied to their high demands for lighting, water flow, and pristine water chemistry. The challenge is compounded by their need for incredible stability of those three parameters. On the surface, it sounds simple, but those that have successfully kept Acropora understand the underlying difficulty. All these things, lighting, flow, and proper chemical levels are a moving target. A fast-growing SPS reef is dynamic in nature. The lighting a coral receives increases for the parts of the colony that extends upwards towards the light, while simultaneously shading parts of its own structure and all the corals unfortunate enough to be below it. Flow changes as colonies grow densely packed branches and stifle what was once strong water movement through the aquascape. Lastly, chemistry changes as the uptake of major and minor elements accelerates geometrically. In extremely packed SPS tanks, it's common for hobbyists to have to incorporate several methods of calcium and alkalinity addition because the growth of the corals outpace the ability of any single method to maintain desired levels. If their requirements are not met, a perfectly healthy colony of Acropora today might become a pristine white skeleton tomorrow. Let's go over each of these parameters in turn. Most coral on the reef are photosynthetic and have some demand for light. Like many corals, Acropora have a special symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae that live inside its tissue. The dinoflagellates are actually the photosynthetic organism, and the coral animal derives nutrients off of the byproducts of the dinoflagellates' photosynthetic process. Zooxanthellae is usually brown in color, and the coral tightly regulates the population that's living in its flesh. Too little light will cause the coral to turn brown in color. As it seeks more nutrition, the coral allows more zooxanthellae to build up in its flesh. Too much light, and Acropora will expel more of the zooxanthellae and cause an unhealthy bleaching appearance. Hobbyists looking to find that just right color play with both lighting intensity and spectrum over their tank. There is a misconception in reef keeping that all corals require high lighting. In fact, very few corals need high intensity lighting, and in many cases, problems arise when there's too much light, not too little. Acropora, however, are one of the few types of corals that are truly light loving. In our systems, Acropora have fared best when given light intensity around 300 par. However, there are plenty of successful systems with lighting intensities higher than 500 par. Now having said that, I don't recommend blasting a newly added Acropora with a ton of light right away. More damage is caused by overexposure to light intensity than not providing enough light, so take a couple of weeks to allow the coral to adjust to lighting conditions in your tank. As for lighting technology, there's no consensus within the reef aquarium community as to which lighting technology is best for growth and coloration of Acropora. 
The two most popular lighting technologies today are LED and T5 fluorescent. However, some old school reef keepers swear by metal halide lights. Now each type of light has its positives and negatives. First, let's talk about LED. LED light is the newest technology whose strong points include energy efficiency, relatively low heat emission, long life with little to no bulb replacements, and ultimate controllability. LED light, especially towards the blue spectrum, does an amazing job of displaying a coral's fluorescence. No other form of light captures the color or intensity of the fluorescent proteins in the corals. When LEDs first entered the mainstream, there were questions of their viability for growing corals and achieving comparable coloration compared to the existing lighting technologies. Initial experiences were mixed, to say the least, and many early adopters ended up switching back to their original lighting systems. At the time, the lighting spectrum of LEDs were not as robust as metal halide or T5 fluorescent lighting, and many of the fixtures struggled to adequately diffuse the light emitting from the LEDs themselves. Early models of LED fixtures produced a highly like directional spotlight appearance. What would happen is the tops of the colony would receive light and grow, but a harsh shadow would be cast on the portions of the colony that did not get hit by that directional light. That harsh shadow was basically zero light, and that dark part of the colony would struggle and then eventually die off. Today, LED technology has come a long way in terms of both the lighting spectrum and diffusion, making it a very attractive choice given its other advantages. Lighting spectrum was solved to some degree by the introduction of different colored LEDs. Diffusion was handled by a change in the optics around each LED, as well as some lighting fixtures offering an optional diffuser plate to further scatter the light before it hits the water. Due to these recent improvements, not only are many aquarists reporting good growth of Acropora, the coloration is outstanding. Still, there are some holdouts in the SPS community that swear by fluorescent or metal halide bulbs. So let's talk about those starting with T5s. T5 fluorescent bulbs are thin glass tubes that produce a very robust light spectrum that colors up corals very nicely. There are a lot of bulb choices available, which can give your tank pretty much any kind of aesthetic. Variation of light over the course of the day is done by either turning off individual bulbs or in some advanced T5 fixtures, dimming the bulbs. Lastly, because of the light emitted by a T5 bulb is spread out evenly over the length of the bulb, there's almost no trace of shadowing effects that plagued point source lighting. No lighting system is perfect, however, and T5 fixtures have their drawbacks. First off, the bulb life is frustratingly short. They begin to erode both in terms of spectrum and intensity right around six months, and by 12 months, they are a drastically different bulb. Here at the Tidal Gardens greenhouse, I run them a lot longer than that, just because they're supplementing the sunlight we receive. But when I do finally get around to swapping out the bulbs, the difference is very noticeable. Acropora are very sensitive to changes in light, and going from old, underperforming bulbs to bright new ones might cause a shock to the system. It's recommended to either replace the bulbs earlier so the drop off in intensity is not so pronounced, or even implement a staggered bulb replacement schedule so that not all the tubes are exchanged all at once. These techniques would smooth out the shifts in light intensity over the course of the year. The second downside is the lackluster energy efficiency of T5 fluorescence. While not horrible, on a per bulb basis, they're not as good as LED lights. Depending on the number of bulbs in the fixture, it can get expensive to operate. For example, if you have an eight bulb fixture, the electrical consumption along with the cost of bulb replacements might make for possibly the most expensive lighting upkeep out of all of the technologies. Lastly, the bulbs themselves are fragile and they can break easily during shipping, especially when you consider the longer bulb lengths of 48 inches or 60 inches. Finally, we get to metal halide, 
which I would venture to guess is the least popular form of lighting at the hobbyist level, and quite possibly the most popular lighting at the commercial level. The positive aspects of metal halide are its intensity, spectrum, and longevity. When it comes to growing light-loving corals like Acropora, I don't think any other technology does it as well. Metal halide bulbs are a point light source, like LEDs, but they're even more concentrated. When shining down into the tank, they create a very pleasing shimmer effect, which is almost absent under the diffused light of T5 fluorescence. Those shimmer lines closely replicate what's seen in nature, and there was a study done several years back that indicated corals actually benefited from them. The major problem with metal halide is energy consumption and heat. Metal halide bulbs consume a lot of electricity, and it's gonna be noticeable on your monthly electric bill if you've installed a new metal halide fixture. The heat generated by metal halide is also something that has to be dealt with. In large aquariums situated in a large room, some well-placed cooling fans might do the trick. On smaller aquariums or in tight quarters where heat builds up, one might need to install a chiller or turn up the air conditioning to compensate. Either way, Heat management will further increase that electricity bill. In terms of controllability, it's practically absent from these bulbs. They can turn on and off. In some ways, they don't even do that all that well because some require a cooling off period before being able to turn back on. There are dimmable metal halides, but there's some anecdotal evidence out there that it's not great for the bulbs and some metal halides will shift color as a result. Choosing a lighting system for Acropora can be daunting, but the obvious solution to deciding on a fixture is to find one that has everything. Hybrid lighting systems exist that combine either LED and T5, or metal halide and T5, or metal halide and LED. There might even be some systems out there that are a combination of all three. That fixture might be shockingly expensive, so here's a cost-saving tip. Let's say you have some LED fixture that you're happy with, but want to supplement it with T5, but you don't like the look of T5 bulbs. What you could do is purchase an inexpensive T5 fixture and only run it for about four to six hours while you're away from the tank. That way, the coral still benefit from the light and color up nicely, but it doesn't interfere with the aesthetic of the LEDs when you return home. Let's move on to the issue of water flow. Acropora are found in some of the strongest current areas of the reef and benefit greatly from strong water movement in the home aquarium. Water movement is essential for bringing nutrients to coral and more importantly, removing waste away from them. Acropora even grow in patterns to adapt to the flow in a given area. For example, Acropora in very strong flow grow thicker and more dense than in tanks with less flow. Some species of Acropora might even take on a stockier shape with fewer long branches in very high flow areas. The growth of the colony in relation to flow also plays a part in their nutrition. They might be growing in such a way to maximize bacterial growth between the branches. One publication that I found interesting was from Coral Reef in 1989 by Schiller and Herndl. Basically, they took a look at the interstitial space around certain SPS. They looked at a few different parameters, such as ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, phosphorus, and bacteria levels between the branches on the interior of the colony, and compared that to the ambient water column. What they found was that there were lower concentrations of dissolved organics in the interstitial space, with an associated uptick in the concentration of bacteria. The corals may be feeding on bacteria directly or indirectly attracting micro-feeding zooplankton that they then trap and consume. But it's interesting that the coral study grow in a fashion that optimizes flow through the branches to maximize bacteria farming opportunities. When trying to provide adequate flow, there are two things over time that dramatically affects the performance. The first is the growth of the colony itself. Successfully growing Acropora quickly comes with the downside of the coral being a victim of its own success. Large colonies cut down flow significantly and over time choke off flow to other nearby colonies or even to the inner parts of itself. As colonies get larger and larger, 
it's important as hobbyists to pay close attention to changing flow demands and consider either adding more flow or pruning the colony. Secondly, you may notice that there isn't quite as much flow as you once had when everything was freshly installed. Other organisms love to grow in and around the aquarium's pumps and plumbing. For this reason, I recommend taking apart pumps and power heads regularly for servicing. It doesn't take very much growth or that many blockages to greatly limit water flow output. Ready to talk about chemistry? Acropora are more sensitive to water conditions than most other corals in the hobby. They require both clean water and consistent high levels of major ions to maintain stony coral growth. Suboptimal water chemistry, or even quick changes in water chemistry, can lead to quick colony die-off or long periods of color loss. As far as water cleanliness goes, two parameters to keep low are nitrate and phosphate. Elevated phosphates can lead to poor coloration and possible algae issues in the tank as a whole. Nitrate is an indicator of poor water quality and can cause stony corals to crash altogether if not lowered. The natural seawater levels of nitrate are between 5 parts per million and 40 parts per million. For Acropora, it's best to be on the lower end of that range. Phosphate levels should be much lower, around 0.01 parts per million, but I would caution hobbyists that are looking to keep these two parameters as close to zero as possible. Nitrate and phosphate are not bad in and of themselves. Elevated levels of them can cause problems, but they are absolutely required for biological processes in corals and cannot be produced through photosynthesis. Moving on, there are three major chemical parameters that are needed by Acropora to build up its stony skeleton. These are calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. The chemical interaction of these three, it's a little out of the scope of this video, but I've made separate videos covering each of these in greater detail that I will link. Here's a brief summary of all three, starting with calcium. Calcium is one of the major ions in salt water. In most healthy reefs, the calcium level hovers around 425 parts per million. Alkalinity is a little more difficult to explain than calcium. It's not a particular ion, but it can be thought of as the buffering capacity of salt water. Buffering capacity is the amount of acid required to lower the pH of salt water to the point bicarbonate turns into carbonic acid. Now that sounds overly technical, but in layman's terms, higher alkalinity levels equate to greater chemical stability in our reef tanks. In practice, alkalinity tends to be the parameter that fluctuates the most of the three, and it's the one that needs the most babysitting. In the wild, the alkalinity of the water is around 8 to 9 dKH. One quick note about adjusting calcium and alkalinity. It can be tricky because of how they interact. For example, if your reef tank has a calcium level of, let's say, 300 parts per million, when you desire a value closer to 400 parts per million, you could theoretically add a calcium supplement to boost it. Unfortunately, reef aquarium chemistry is dynamic, and solutions to chemistry issues are rarely that straightforward in practice. Addition of a calcium supplement can often come with a corresponding fall in alkalinity levels. This seesaw effect between calcium and alkalinity stems from how the two ions interact with one another. The two ions combine to form calcium carbonate and fall out of solution, thus lowering both levels. If you are experiencing this in your systems, the possible culprit with calcium and alkalinity instability could be magnesium. It may seem counterintuitive that the solution to calcium and alkalinity imbalances is to elevate magnesium, but the three ions interact regularly. Magnesium is very similar chemically to calcium. It can bind up carbonate ions, thus increasing the overall bioavailability of alkalinity compounds in the water. So again, if you find that no amount of tweaking calcium and alkalinity directly is helping, you may want to make sure that it's not your magnesium level that's in fact low. Having said all that about tweaking levels of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium to something resembling natural saltwater levels, it's not something that you want to do in a knee-jerk fashion. 
Acropora respond very poorly to sweeping changes in chemistry. For example, if alkalinity dips, they may take on a brown coloration and stay that way for months, even if those alkalinity levels are corrected. The best advice that I can give is to strive for consistency, even if the values on the test kit are not ideal, and slowly, very slowly, try to raise them over the course of weeks or even months. Again, just maintaining levels is tricky. Successful acropora-filled tanks experience rapid growth, and larger colonies soak up calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and trace elements at a much faster rate. This is why, for my system here, I like to provide as stable a baseline as possible through water changes and calcium reactors. And then on top of that, add chemical additives when necessary. Chemistry is a really big topic, and there's many ways to be successful maintaining it. A while ago, I did a video looking at three very nice aquariums that are Acropora dominated, and they handle the maintenance of chemical parameters in vastly different ways. I'll link that video as well for you to check out. We talked earlier of Acropora nutrition when we were talking about lighting, but the requirements extend beyond their relationship with those anthelae. Although a high percentage of Acropora's nutritional requirements are acquired by photosynthesis, they also benefit from regular feeding for both growth and coloration. There are three great sources of food that will work well. Amino acids, small zooplankton, and simply having fish present. Starting with amino acids, they are simple organic compounds containing a carboxyl group and an amino group. To quote every high school biology textbook, they are the components of proteins that are the building blocks of the cell. In addition to their role building proteins, they are also necessary for other biological functions such as neurotransmitter transport and biosynthesis. The amino acids needed vary on a species-by-species -species basis, but practically speaking, it makes little difference in the long run because even if certain amino acids go unutilized by a certain acropora, they will be taken up quickly by another organism for their biological processes. There are several commercially available amino acid additives, so you don't have to overthink it too much. Small zooplankton include things such as rotifers and cyclops plankton. The rotifers that we feed are usually around a half a millimeter in size. Cyclops plankton are larger, typically between one to two millimeters. They come frozen and are basically a small granular oily paste that creates an orange cloud when introduced into the tank. The presence of rotifers in the water is apparent to the corals because many of them will immediately open up and start their feeding behavior. Acropora do this to a lesser degree, but what's noticeable are white strings of mucus leading to each of the small polyps. Over the next several minutes, the Acropora corals will retract the strings and feed on the zooplankton trapped. Last point on nutrition, a higher volume of fish in the aquarium do seem to have a positive effect on Acropora coral colonies. This is a purely anecdotal observation but it's one that's also echoed by many other querists that have kept the SPS tank successfully. Perhaps their presence as a nitrogen source in close proximity is a good thing. One caveat that I'll add about feeding is this. Although coral nutrition is important, it's equally important to make sure to not overfeed the aquarium. Overfeeding can lead to issues such as algae or cyanobacteria blooms that can be a hassle to overcome. A little bit of feeding goes a long way, but all the benefits can be wiped out by a nutrient overload caused by overfeeding, so go slow and keep a close eye for signs of nutrient overload, such as nuisance algae or greatly elevated nitrates. Okay, now it's time to cover some of the ugly parts of keeping Acropora, namely diseases and pests. Acropora are sometimes stricken with either rapid tissue necrosis or slow tissue necrosis. These ailments plague the tanks of both beginner SPS keepers and experienced SPS keepers alike. What makes these diseases all the more frustrating to deal with is that there's no consensus on what causes them. Much of the discussion in the community revolves around fluctuations in chemical parameters, especially calcium and alkalinity. However, there are plenty of examples 
of aquariums with rock-solid chemistry that still fall victim to RTN or STN. Other potential culprits include high organic levels, phosphates and nitrates, lack of water flow, and high temperatures. It's a perplexing problem because a colony might be doing well for years in the same tank and one day lose majority of its tissue overnight. It's very possible that a fluctuation in some tank parameter causes RTN or STN, but it's also possible that the Acropora colony tolerated a suboptimal condition for an extended period of time before reaching a sudden tipping point. As far as treatments go, some hobbyists have had some success stopping the tissue accession by dipping the Acropora colonies in an iodine solution such as Lugol's. Personally, I have not had any luck with that approach and resort to quickly propagating the colony in hopes that one of the frags will survive and regrow. What tends to work best is to cut healthy portions of the colony and re-glue them to a fresh substrate. Some of these fresh cuttings may not survive, but hopefully some will. It's not an ideal solution, but if left uncut, the necrosis will spread throughout the coral and you'll be left with nothing. Acropora sometimes falls victim to a variety of pests. The two most commonly seen in home aquariums are Acropora-eating flatworms and small crustaceans hobbyists have called red bugs. Acropora-eating flatworms are difficult to see. This is due to their bodies mimicking the color and texture of the coral itself. The only telltale sign of them is the Acropora will lose its brilliant color in favor of a more tannish brown appearance and then start to show white bite marks. The coloration of the Acropora alone, it's easy to dismiss. As we've discussed before, Acropora can change color dramatically for numerous reasons, so oftentimes a hobbyist will ignore a colony starting to turn brown and attribute the change to some other changing parameter. Once the white bite marks start to appear though, it's clear that there's flatworms present and the coral must be treated with a series of pest control dips to remove the existing flatworms as well as any newly hatched flatworms that emerge from the eggs that are unfortunately resistant to dipping. In some extreme cases of flatworm infestation, the pest control dip will dislodge a shocking number of flatworms to the point that it looks like there's more flatworms on the coral than actual coral flesh. Yeah. What you were looking at the whole time was just flatworms. Once Acropora colonies get huge or fuse to the rockwork, periodic dipping is no longer a viable solution. At that point, whole tank treatments must be considered, such as flatworm exit or levamisol. Both of those treatments cause a lot of death and destruction in the tank, so it's important to do massive water changes and run activated carbon aggressively to remove both the treatment and the toxins released from hordes of dying invertebrates. It's an extreme measure, no doubt, but in a well-established tank, sometimes it's the only alternative. Typically, I look for fish or some method of biological control of pests, but unfortunately, I haven't found anything that adequately deals with Acropora-eating flatworms. Red bugs are less of a concern than flatworms, but should be dealt with nonetheless. They're essentially fleas on the coral that irritate the colony and might slow the overall growth of the coral or limit its coloration. The issue with red bugs is that they're very small and difficult to see. Most hobbyists with Acropora struggling with red bugs never even know the pest is present. It's only when another hobbyist points it out that the infestation becomes clear. Like with many things in this hobby, once you see a problem, you can't unsee it. So when looking closely at any Acropora colony, they just immediately pop out now. Red bugs seem to be resistant to a wide range of dips. However, some of the more aggressive dips seem to work. The dips based on pine oil tend to be too weak, while dips like Bayer insect killer tend to be more effective. The best chemical treatment I've ever come across is a prescription medication for dogs called Interceptor that can be used to treat an entire tank. The risk with more harsh chemical treatments is the coral itself might be aggravated by the dip and start to lose tissue. When dipping, always consider the risk-reward because some pests are relatively mild and the treatment could be far more damaging. My personal favorite way to eradicate red bugs is to add a fish called a dragon face pipefish. They're known to eat red bugs and over time they eliminate the problem. 
the problem with dragonface pipefish is that they're not particularly good swimmers. They can handle swimming in the flow of an SPS aquarium. However, oftentimes that flow is generated by large powerheads sitting inside the aquarium. It's possible that some of these pumps are too strong and can kill the poor fish that gets caught in its suction. What some aquarists have done is to keep a refugium that's plumbed into the main system and house the pipefish in that tank. If an Acropora colony gets red bugs, it can be removed from the display and into the refugium for a period of time. One last suggestion with pest control is to have some specific Acropora that are more prone to these pests in the tank. In essence, they're acting as the proverbial canary in the coal mine. In large aquaculture facilities, these corals are great not only for detection, but also for treatment. By aggressively monitoring and dipping slash physically removing the pests from these corals, over time it eliminates the problem from the entire system. Clearly it's possible for pests to move around and move off of these corals and onto others, but the pests have a preference for these canaries and over time find their way to them for extraction. Okay, that does it for Acropora. Although I can't recommend Acropora for a beginning hobbyist, hopefully this video is helpful for those looking to try them for the first time. They are a beautiful coral, and a tank dedicated to them can be a breathtaking explosion of color that rewards all the diligence on the part of the hobbyist. This video ran long, but hopefully it provides an overall look at the different facets of Acropora care that's needed to be successful. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you'd like more information or perhaps purchase an Acropora for your home aquarium, I invite you to visit us at tidalgardens.com and see what we have going on there. Acropora is one of the corals that we're going to be focusing on propagating in the coming months. That does it for this video. So until next time, happy reefing. <laughs>